this first session of the conference this year is is themed broadly historic landscapes. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to think and, and a little bit about this this year. It's a, it's a research topic close to close to my own research interests. I think really it's great as well to be able to highlight the the importance, the continued importance of studying the past uh, and its ongoing relevance to to decision making we all have to make in the present day. We asked the, the panel to think a little bit about questions such as why are landscapes important and, and how might we address future landscapes thinking about the past? Should we be rewilding, for example? Should we be preserving landscape or conserving them? Um, we've got a, a great panel to, to discuss those themes. Um, briefly, our, um, our panel is, is Jonathan Last from Historic England, Hannah O'Regan from the University of Nottingham, Robert Hearn also from the University of Nottingham, and Rachel Hall from the National Trust. And I'd like to thank them all in particular for giving up their time this morning to talk to us. Um, and without any further ado, I'll ask Jonathan to, to start with his five minutes. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, thanks, Matthew. OK, I'm going to try and share my screen. Hopefully, you can yes, see that. Yeah, that's good. OK, um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Jonathan Last and I'm a prehistorian and landscape archaeologist in the archaeological investigation team at Historic England. So the first question posed for today's discussion was why are landscapes important for people? Um, well, I thought about this and thought I'd try and answer by turning it around. So why are people important for landscapes? And can there even be landscapes without people? If we work with the European Landscape Convention definition, then it has to include both the cultural and the natural, and it has to be perceived by people. I think it's a very useful definition. Perhaps the only thing I'll change is to allow species other than humans a say in the perception of landscape. But the point remains that landscapes are more than just land. So this, however much it looks like it, is not landscape. Or rather, by the ELC definition, we perceive it just on the point of becoming landscape. In taking the photograph, um, perseverance allows that part of the Martian surface to be perceived and named and therefore made into a place. So by moving around, making tracks, taking samples and photos, the Martian surface is encultured into landscape and it's immediately historical. It now has an archaeological record, whatever parts and traces, perseverance and other landers might leave behind. So what's this got to do with the historic landscape here on Earth? Well, we can imagine a starting point here too, when Paleolithic people first arrived, treading lightly perhaps, but giving names to place, places and features, creating places and paths, extracting resources and beginning the process of shaping the landscapes we have today. And after all those millennia, um, the whole landscape is both cultural and historical by definition, however natural, in inverted commas, it may look. The paradox can be seen perhaps in our designated areas of outstanding natural beauty as we gaze across an entirely cultural fieldscape in the Lincolnshire Wolds, for example. If something is landscape, then it has character and that character always has a historic dimension which we can visualise in different ways, such as through the technique of historic landscape characterisation, or HLC. Here's just an example of what that looks like. <laughs> 
Um, HLC sets out to record the typical or everyday historical aspects of, of places. Um, I mean, interestingly, since the, the title of this session, well, it, it's been billed as historical landscapes and introduced as historic landscapes. Perhaps we can think about a subtle difference between these. Um, Pete Herring has recently written that the, the historic in HLC might in retrospect have been historical to avoid any sense of an emphasis on those aspects of a landscape we might regard as special. Um, instead, characterization focuses on the, compre the comprehensive nature of landscape and counters our tendency to think of the historic or historical landscape as a scatter of discrete heritage assets, as they might be termed with blank areas in between. But HLC is explicitly concerned with those aspects of the past that can be seen in and from the present. And of course, there's much more to the historic landscape than what's currently visible. So just as all landscapes matter, according to the ELC, so all landscapes have time depth. And the job of the archaeologist is to reveal that past shaping of landscape. The irony is that since the developer funded principle came in 30 years or so ago, so much archaeology has occurred in the areas that are typically perceived as lacking history, the housing estates, ring roads, business parks and retail centres, exactly what uh, Marc Auger has called non places. So archaeology can help people understand the deep history of the apparently ahistorical landscapes where they live, work and travel. And the juxtaposition of the non-places with the deep history, this kind of inversion, seems to me to fit Foucault's idea of the heterotopia, in which archaeology poses questions about the relationships between past and contemporary landscapes, just as those views of Mars force us to confront what we actually mean by landscape. And so to end, as requested by looking a little bit to the future, However much we talk about preservation, the landscape is always changing. Um, the Dutch in particular understand long term landscape change, um, as these maps show, just as an illustration. Um, we can't control that change, but we can try and shape it to conserve historic character and to make the past visible, if not through physical stuff, then perhaps through digital technology. So I'm not sure rewilding is the right word for these future landscapes. Rather than restoring an illusory nature, we need to break down the old nature culture dichotomy. In the Netherlands, such transdisciplinary of future landscapes is often highlighted. Um, and this I suggest is what we need more of here. And that's my five minutes, thank you. Many thanks, Jonathan. What's to, what's to ponder? Hannah. OK, right. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Hannah O'Regan from the Department of Classics and Archaeology at the University of Nottingham, and I'm going to give perhaps a slightly more narrative um, approach than, than that that we've just had from Jonathan. So I was thinking about, you know, landscapes and places. And um, for people, landscapes and people, uh, play, landscapes are places that have meaning to them. And that meaning could be uh, very small. It could be the place you went for a walk with your mother or your grandparents on a regular basis, or it could be something as large as sort of Humphrey Repton reorganizing an entire village and moving them in order to have a nice vista from your country house. So there's all sorts of different scales that we see when we're thinking about what, what is important to, in a landscape to people. Um, and we also need to think about what counts as heritage within that landscape. And this is where I hope I'm going to share my screen effectively. Yes. OK, so here we have um, Swinside Stone Circle from Cumbria. As you can see, it's um, down there in the bottom uh, left hand corner. And, you know, it's a Neolithic stone circle. It's what, 5000 years old ish. Um, and it sits there within its landscape. You can see some sheep. So, um, you know, it's a grazed landscape now. It would have been placed in an area that had been cleared by people. And I think many of us would agree that this counts as heritage. You know, it's very old and it has its place within the landscape. But then 
we could move on to somewhere like Burwell Fen. Now, is this a heritage landscape? It is in many ways. So Burwell is a, a Fenland. Um, well, it was only drained back in the 1940s. So it's been, um, it's been affected by people, but only relatively recently. However, before that, it had a whole um, sort of life of its own. And you can see here we've got um, some highland cows, which are doing some of the job that an oryx or extinct wild cattle might have done. And we've also got some Kerning ponies in the background, also doing some grazing jobs that, um, that um, wild horses would have done, although in Britain, um, horses weren't always around. So this is a landscape, but it's a very different landscape, but it also has heritage. Not only does it have the heritage sort of intrinsic with having people living and working in this environment for generations, and the Fenland environment was a very different environment to the upland um, world of, of Swingside. It's also a place that had a wide variety of animals that don't live there anymore. So Burwell, for example, came with bears. Um, you can just see on the back of that photograph as well, there's an otter. And there are many, many beaver uh, bones from Burwell Fen as well, which have been catalogued by Bryony Coles. So Burwell had a wide variety of mammals which aren't there anymore. So at what point are we thinking of that heritage of this site? Where, where, do, we, where do we draw that line? And also just thinking about the fen fens more broadly, oops, when you look at that Fenland landscape, in many places, the only landmarks you can see for a very long distance are the humanly made landscapes, um, the, sorry, the humanly made landmarks, the um, church towers, the, you know, the Tower of Ely Cathedral. It's those that tell you where you are within a very large flat landscape. Although if it is your sort of natural home, if you know it, then you would know where you were because of the smells, of the plants, of the trees that are there or whatever. So it, the, the way that you interact with the landscape does very much depend on how um, involved with it you are. OK, but the key point, I think, is that landscapes in Britain aren't natural. Jonathan's just shown us that photograph of the uh, wolds in Lincolnshire. And it's also true. Um, when we think about um, places like the Peak District, which were heavily mined in the Roman period, or even Nottinghamshire now, there were coal mines. Um, most of them you know, have pretty much vanished. We've got some strange shaped hills, which are now, which were the, um, the sort of stag heaps, but, or the mining tailings, um, but they're, they're covered in grass and you wouldn't necessarily know what you were looking at unless somebody told you. So many aspects of the, of the human interaction with these landscapes are now not visible, but it doesn't mean that they're not there. So if we're thinking about returning to a, a landscape, to a natural state, where, what do we mean? Oh. Uh, what, what do we mean by that um, landscape? Um, was it when the romantic poets were being nice about the Lake District? Was it when bears and beavers were roaming? Was it when mammoths were wandering around? You know, um, we, there are, there's no sensible necessarily baseline that we could take things back to because things have constantly changed. Rivers have moved. We've had glaciers. So it's not just the land, you know, the animals and the, and the trees and things, the actual land itself is moving. Um, so we've got coastlines eroding, we have rivers moved by glacial activity, we've got all sorts of change happening. So it's never static. Also, this is somewhat homocentric. I've mentioned the bear from Burwell Fen and looking at um, this view, this is the view from Foxhole Cave up near um, Buxton. And you can see it's lovely, a grazed, managed landscape from you know, the modern period. But let's go back 10, 11,000 years and imagine the trail of bears that would be wandering their way into this cave over generations to hibernate. And so this is the entrance to Foxhole. Obviously, they wouldn't have gone through the gate. They'd have crawled down this passage and gone to sleep in the end. And some of them never woke up from that hibernation and ended up as dead bears in the back of the cave. But there are hundreds of bears, bone bear, bo bears of bone, no, bones of bears from Foxhole. So they were going in for generations and generations. And, you know, much of what we think about when we think about the landscapes is very human centric. And 
um, I think it's important to think about, you know, we've got badgers who've been using the same sets for generations. We had bears that were using caves for generations. Um, it's not just necessarily a human landscape. What we can do about that, well, how we incorporate that is an entirely different um, matter. But I think it's interesting to think about. So when it comes to sort of rewilding, preserving, conserving, what do we want to go back to? Can we go back? I think it's unlikely. So there are many things have changed. So it's a case of coming up with our least worst scenario, I think. And that's me done. Many thanks, Anna. Robert, all yours. OK, well, sorry about that, Hannah. I touched something. That was me that caused that blip. Right, OK, so my name is Robert and I'm an assistant professor in human geography at the University of Nottingham, specifically in an interest in culture and historical geography. Cultural historical geography, really an area where we really try to look at that binary that Jonathan mentioned at the beginning between nature and culture. And I particularly look at this by way of looking at the animal, the more than human other, if you like, and that's to see how we're looking at animals, how we can then think about landscapes and particularly, you know, think about these multi-species entanglements and assemblies which characterise so many historic landscapes, but also in the way that can inform future trajectories. So I'm just going to talk quickly today about uh, my research. I say I've always been at Nottingham, I did my undergraduate, my first time I met Dr Robert Lambert, uh, who I then did my master's with, and then I went on to do my PhD and look in, in Italy, particularly this part of Italy here, which is known as the, well, by its name, which is the Alta Val di Varda there. And that's actually where I am now. I'm sitting talking to you from Geneva today. Now, this is the Alta Val di Varda, as we see it today. As you can see, it's a mixed agricultural pastoral landscape, especially up in the higher peaks there. But you'll also be able to see the signs of this process of dewilding. Now, we're seeing it's a particular it's a rewilded landscape. It's all grown up. It's thickly cloaked in this in this wood, dense woodland and things. And um, where I do my particular research is around Varese Lugli, which is this place here, which is a really interesting example of a rewilded landscape here. Now it's a rewilded because it became, it was considered conspicuously dewilded in the past. Indeed, if we look at the 19th century, we see that the whole space was very, very intensively used. However, since the 1950s, it's become dewilded, uh, rewilded, should I say, as people have drifted away for various different reasons and it's gone into abandonment and rural depopulation here, just some photographs that I took in the particular area. Now, as you see from this photograph, the effects of this rewilding on the landscape are very conspicuous. That old photograph I found in a museum there, viewed from the same viewpoint. So you can really see how the agricultural terraces have disappeared amongst this thick cloak of woodland, and the upper areas have always become rewooded as well as um, traditional pastoral practices have also declined along with that the disappearance of people. Now, these two species have been conspicuous components of rewilding in this area. And this is what my PhD and my research is upon, basically the grey wolf or the Italian wolf, there's some debate over that, and the wild boar. And both animals disappeared in the 19th century when the landscape was dewilded and have reappeared as it was rewilded. But it's interesting in looking at these animals, how actually, you know, uh, the way in which rewild is understood is often projected and thought about by way of conspicuous faunal species such as these animals here. Now, wolves and wild boar coming back tell a story of European relative success. Actually, as we see here, there's been a large comeback of wildlife across Europe there. Admittedly, it was very low 1960s, 70s on continental Europe. However, these different processes, I mean, animals are coming back. And indeed, it's a good time to be an animal in Europe. We see these lots of different examples, the bear, the badger there, the Eurasian lynx, ibex species, various different species are coming back. And not to forget, of course, the bird life they were coming back. And so whilst the physical landscape has become rewilded, so is our sort of our imagination has become rewilded too. Now, this rewilding, as we know, is a complex term. And this article here, actually, by Dolly Jorgensen from Stavanger, talks about the different ways in which we use these terms. And this is, I think, really important when we think about rewilding, to think about who's using these words, how we're using them, how we're thinking about them, and for what, whose benefit, if you like. And particularly, um, yeah, to think about how we can coexist in these landscapes. Now, as I said, the wolf and the wild boar, 
they both disappeared, but they both come back now. And actually, by coming back into this wilderness, into this rewilded landscape, if you like, there's been different reactions. The, they both they both cause problems on the landscape. Well, certainly for the human character protagonists, for, for example, the wild boar destroy plants, many things like this, but they have a value as in we can eat them. And as we see here, the culture of the wild boar has become revitalized and it's a way of people to actually engage and think about and then become entangled with the particular landscape by communing with these different performances and things. The wolf, for example, as we come back, is promoting a much more different response. Here we see where people are delighted, there's museums, there's exhibitions, all different ways for engaging with this historic landscape by drawing on the idealised uh, imagination of what the wolf is and crucially where the wolf lives. And that's where by these areas. However, as we've seen here, some photographs from my research show that rewilding, particularly the presence of the wolf, is not a positive thing for the people that live there. And these are decapitations, a really potent example of how people voice their opposition to rewilding. So again, people taking out their anger, if you like, on the wolf as a way of voicing their opponent opposition to rewilding. Rewilding, they think, is a way in which they're actually, you know, um, not directly involved in their landscape. And here's is a general pattern here. The sign there says there's always lots of money for the wolves, but there's not for schools. So again, it shows these competing claims on the landscape. However, of course, there's a pro-wolf lobby as well. And crucially now in thinking about this historic landscape, thinking about wolves and people, it's about coexistence. And this is what they're now particularly working on. So how can we recognise the place of this assemblage in this lively, living, historic landscape there? So as I said, looking at these examples here, we can think about animals being in and out of place. We also think about how the animal becomes a subject for competing claims over space, place, location, environment and landscape. If you like, there's a bit of geography bingo for you there. And crucially, when thinking about historic landscapes, but crucially a way of thinking about the future of historic landscapes, the disappearance and the reappearance has made these biodiversity and biosecurity agendas of the people there with the, with the people from out there, okay? So it's become a site of conflict. It's become a site really of a, a big debate. And this is really completing philosophies of nature, okay? So actually by thinking about the animal in the landscape, appreciating the more than human living landscapes of this, we need to think about how we can manage, behave in a way, in a modern future landscape, which sort of gives voices and gives, they recognize the, you know, the legitimate rights of all things within this landscape. So it's very, very complex. And so thinking about these ideas, why are landscapes important for people? Well, because of their sense of place, their identity, their involvement. They are part of it. They created these cultural landscapes. For example, they're not natural landscapes. These are semi-natural. How do we readdress future landscapes? Well, we need to talk to people. You can't just put laws on people living in these areas. You have to be for conciliation, talk to them. OK, and to rewild, preserve or conserve. Well, if it has to be one of them, it could be, I think, conserve would be the most appropriate because rewilding is seems to be provoking too much wide ranging um, issues. So that's all I've got to say. If that's OK. Thanks, Robert. There we go. Great. And our final panelist, Rachel. So I'm going to try and share my screen for you and hopefully this will work. Brilliant, thanks Matthew. So firstly, very jealous of your location there, Robert. I had no idea you were sitting in Italy when we spoke earlier. Hey, um, I just introduced myself very quickly. I'm Rachel Hall, I'm from the National Trust and I work for a team within the National Trust called The Consultancy. And we're a group of specialists who work in anything from marketing to nature conservation, to archaeology, to estate management. And I think what's really interesting about my team, it's um, a team that's based around landscape and we're looking at land and nature. But again, we're a blended team of natural environment and historic environment specialists working to find really good solutions for managing our landscapes today. So National Trust, um, I'm going to be speaking from the perspective of a, a large landowner. We own um, over 250,000 hectares of uh, landscapes across uh, Wales, 
England and Northern Ireland. So those landscapes could be anything from coastal landscapes to countryside to historic parklands and gardens. So we've got a huge and diverse uh, selection of landscapes that we're working with and managing every day. So what I thought I'd do just before I came on here today, I thought, oh gosh, I must better have a look and see what uh, my organisation says about historic landscapes and, and why we find them important. So I had a quick look on our website, which you can all do after this. And it reminded me that National Trust, that we are looking after places forever for everyone. We're protecting and caring for nature, beauty and places for people. So that's our cause and very much um, at the heart of the work that myself and our team work towards on a daily basis. So we also talk about historic landscapes and the importance of understanding them for understanding distinctiveness and character and what makes places special to people, where people sit within those landscapes and how they've developed over time. And again, if you go to our website, we talk lots about how we survey them and how we understand them. But it's something a little bit more deeper than what we share on a website we're going to see um, talk about. So again, from that land management perspective, I just thought it would be useful to share a couple of case studies on how we've been looking at landscapes in recent years and how we're looking to manage them in perhaps different ways to what we might have done a couple of decades ago. So I picked this example here. This is the Killerton Estate down near Exeter in Devon. Um, it's actually not an estate that I'm very familiar with, so slightly risky. If you ask me any questions afterwards, I may well not know the answer to it. But one of the reasons I picked it, it was um, it was picked up by the press last week as a landscape restoration project that's taking place on a grand scale at the moment. And Killerton was very successfully awarded uh, a large sum of money through the government's Green Recovery Challenge Fund for the preservation and protection and conservation of historic landscapes. And when you look at this landscape, a little bit like Hannah talked about earlier, you know, it can look reasonably natural on the surface. So we'll probably look uh, beyond that and see those field boundaries and we can see the buildings and again you can see that actually it's really quite um, designed in its layout but to many it looks fairly naturalistic and some some might even consider it wild as well in places so Killerton it's um, you can see probably in that bottom picture is a largely an 18th century house it's got early oranges in the Elizabethan period and um, an 18th century landscape. We own uh, 6,500 hectares there. So just looking at the parkland, what you can't see is the farm estate, and you can't see the many, many archaeological sites that sit within that estate. So what we're doing is we're improving the landscape um, at Killerton for wildlife and also helping to manage some of the climate challenges that we're facing at the moment. So through that Green Recovery Challenge Fund, we're going to be reconnecting the river with its floodplain in the hope that it will um, help to store water and prevent large scale flooding events further downstream. We're planting many miles of hedgerow on the lines of historic hedgerows to gain promote biodiversity and enable these wildlife corridors to connect land connect um, different habitats up with each other and we're also going to be planting wood pasture so how did we get to knowing what we were going to do here at that this estate do you want to see the next slide map please so to take us back to the place where we're going to go to with Killerton in our restoration and conservation work. We've actually just looked back to the 19th century, so we've not gone back so far in history. And again, a really in question, interesting question posed by Hannah is when we're looking at restoration and conservation, where exactly do you go? Here at Killerton, we've done lots and lots of research. I particularly like this example because if you read the press last week, um, you will have come away with the impression that we're restoring a landscape based alone on this painting. Actually, loads and loads of different surveys, surveys on hydrology, surveys on biodiversity, surveys on the historic landscape and soils to enable us to work out what we think right at this moment is a really good solution for restoring that um, historic landscape. And you'll see from this painting back in the 19th century, it's a much richer landscape. 
there are many more trees it's it's again they've got the slightly wilder you'll pop spot there's probably a few highland cattle there we're very keen on our uh, picturesque placement of cattle in many of our 19th and 18th century paintings so we're taking it back to that point so what we're looking to do we're finding a solution there where we're doing, using restoration and conservation to help solve potentially some of those challenges we have today around the crisis in nature and climate change. So I'm just going to move to another case study. So do you want to next slide, Matt, please? So this is up in the Peak Districts, um, and this is the High Peak, the High Peak Moorsland. And again, to many, this landscape looks really wild. Um, it, it looks as um, so though humans may not have touched it, but very quickly you start to unpick that when you see the uh, various pathways that traverse through the landscape. And then you start to look at the historic layers of patterns of trackways and sledways that have been used for hundreds and thousands of years here. So with the High Peak Moors, this is actually quite an exciting time for us because we're looking at what our vision for the next 20 years will be say so 20 years it's not that long some of our visions we look at 50 years and um, 100 years but in looking at what we're going to do with this landscape and how we're going to manage it for people nature and also beauty we're thinking really hard and we're working with lots and lots of different stakeholders so this landscape you'll spot a sheep there so so we know you know we've got on our land we've got two different levels of tenants using this landscape we've got the people um, who are generating an income from this land we need to consider all of that when we're thinking about what to do with these landscapes should we rewild should we protect or should we conserve the so next slide okay so one of the big opportunities we have up in the peak district is to do projects that could potentially uh, help to support um, climate change work that we're working towards at the moment so not quite the same shot but you'll see here we've been doing lots of restoration over again many decades where we're restoring the peat beds because they're fantastic huge sponges that help to soak up some of that water and prevent, prevent flooding further on down um, downstream and also they support a huge amount of biodiversity and again they improve water quality so there's some really good things you can deliver when thinking about how we manage landscapes so just thinking about some of those questions and why it's so important to look to the past to understand what we're going to do with our landscapes today and potentially in the future so there is of course that connection of people to place and that why they love it, helping to understand why they cherish those landscapes and ultimately why they care for them. There's that helping to understand that our landscapes are very dynamic. They, you know, we've had constant change. It takes place at different paces, but they are places of change. So helping people to understand that longer history and that change for perhaps if we are making decisions about changing how we manage something, it might help to make it more acceptable um, and again I think we've got some great opportunities when we're thinking about rewilding natural processes conservation restoration of landscape on what they can do to support those current thinking around climate management of climate change improvement of biodiversity ultimately enriching our landscapes for people and for public benefit so I think just going to finish, I think we're at a really good point really to capitalise on our thinking around historic landscapes. Coming out of the pandemic, we heard lots about um, how people have really valued the countryside, valued being connected to nature. Ultimately, the sort of natural environments <laughs> they're looking at are historic environments. So it's a great time for us to just relink and, and connect that all up and again, help people to connect to their um, past landscape. So that's it for me, thank you.